Well, first of all, a big thank you, Rowena, for joining uh, as our first into what we expect to be and hope to be um, our many sort of Matt CEOs and SLT sessions. Um, I know you've been a uh, Matt CEO now for some time, so about four years altogether in, in two different um, trusts. Um, and most recently in the Astria Academy Trust, which I appreciate, I suppose, since you started, <laughs> probably hasn't been the sort of the normal approach um, that you're probably taking this particular trust. Oh, God, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and even before this, you've also been a trustee as well. So you've been around the sort of mats um, and the education market, I know, for a long time, actually, and even before then as well. Um, I suppose the first question, because I'm quite interested you know, in why people go um, start off as a CEO or want to be a CEO of a mat. So, um, so what, what do you find that's so attractive about working in sort of mats and education? I, I know it sounds like an obvious question, but I think it'd be different for different people. So, uh, well, hi, good morning. Yeah, and it's hi. lovely to see you. Um, so I think the thing about the multi-academy trust part of the education sector is that it is um, very young as, an, as, a, as a sector in itself. And therefore there's lots of scope for innovation and lots of scope for people coming in, not only up through the system, but also from outside of the education system mm. to play quite an interesting leadership role. It's um, individual mats are very often rapidly growing. There are constant challenges as scale develops. And um, for me personally, the thing which is attractive is that opportunity to play in the not quite public, not quite private sector um, kind of part of the landscape where we are subject to public value tests, but we're also trying to bring the best of business thinking, the best of corporate knowledge, behavior, systems, processes, and so on into the public sector. So in terms of it being a kind of merging of, of the best of the private sector and the best of the public sector, I guess that's the thing that I find quite quite compelling. Yeah, that is, that is interesting for sure. Um, and so, you know, you, you, again, you, you, you were already with in Dret before, you see the CEO of Dret before you were um, with, um, with Astria. Can, can you sort of give us a, a sort of a view of, you know, what's, what's it like for the first six months um, of the journey that you go into so what's your thinking you know what do you what, what are the main challenges that you face as part of this sort of the first six months of being a CEO and, and, and what do you focus on? So um, I'm going to put to one side the fact that we've just been through a lockdown because that has made things slightly different and has meant some parts of that um, first six months journey have, have pushed a bit ahead of what I would normally expect to see but, um, but the, the key thing in the early days is to get to a clear single version of the truth. So when you're working in a very distributed organization, my previous trust, the David Ross Education Trust, DRET, um, had 34 schools plus a head office, so 35 different settings. Um, my current trust has 29 plus a head office. So we're working at scale and depending on the evolution of the organization, those um, the, the organization is more or less connected or distributed more or less in common or completely autonomous and separate um, and working out where each part of your um, organization is in terms of its evolutionary journey what its strengths and weaknesses are and where you want to sit on that corporatized versus autonomous continuum and I'm very much on the sort of corporatized centralized standardized end of that thinking um, and I'm very happy to talk a little bit more about that because I think it's quite germane to the way that the trust develops. Um, working out then what your strategy for the next three years is going to be based on understanding where the organisation is, aligning behind a single version of the truth and then mapping your way to where it is you want to get to next. That does take up quite a lot of time. I guess the bit which um, many incoming CEOs overlook is the time that you need to invest in developing relationships with people and during lockdown that's been quite hard but it's also been therefore um, an interesting thinking challenge because if we want to move ahead with pace we have absolutely got to crack relationships based on trust where um, when we're asking school leaders school business managers to do difficult stuff or stuff they might not want to do they have to be able to have that level of trust and confidence that they're going to follow you into battle if, as it were so um a real focus on the development of those relationships in the early days has been important to me as well. So I, get, I, I, want, I definitely want to pick up on that centralised sort of approach. Um, but also, you know, I suppose going back to COVID, 
So how 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 have you been approaching? You know, just because I, I think everybody's been looking at COVID, and in some cases, some of it's been learning, and some of it's you know is is you know everyone talks about the new normal, but where do you see the normal being? You know, along that sort of because you know, it's it's going to be a long. You know, ultimately, some people are going to go very much towards much more online and other people. So where, where along that spectrum do you think the new normal will be? Well, it's, it's interesting, actually. I'm involved with some work at the moment, which we're calling Adopt, Adapt, Abandon, which is trying to work out what we've learned during this period of time, which we think is really great. Um, what we think was OK, but we need to do slightly differently, but we don't want to lose that learning. And what either we've learned that we want to abandon or that we were previously doing, and now we think we've got a better way of doing it, so we want to abandon it. So we're thinking about, for example, um, uh, we've always run, uh, uh, let's think, Easter summer school, uh, so Easter uh, revision camps for children in uh, year 11. Hmm. Um, do we have to now do those as physical camps or could we do those as online tutoring based um, provision for those children? And might we be able to do those better and more efficiently as a result of doing them in the new way rather than going back to doing them in the old way? So that's a really good example of adopt, adapt and abandon all in one go, if you like. We'll be abandoning the old way of doing things, adopting an online kind of way of doing things, but also slightly adapting it to meet that Easter revision school really targeted and tailored kind of approach. So I, I certainly think that there are things that we will um, continue with. I think having run an organization which had quite a good IT infrastructure previously and where in a two, a two week period, well, it had a great IT infrastructure and also um, a common curriculum. So all primary schools and all secondary schools followed the same con uh, curriculum. Um, to some extent contextualized to their local setting, but probably 80% in common across. That meant that in two weeks, the yeah. whole organization could flip from face-to-face -face provision in the classroom to online provision through Google, and also generate really good management information coming out of um, Google Classroom as to the level of engagement of children. I then moved to a different organization which had nothing like that, no common curriculum, so on the, not at all on the standardized end of things. A very, um, uh, trying to think of a polite way of describing it, um, Heath Robinson kind of approach to IT, very much on a break fix model, if you like, yeah. which hadn't ever made that transition to a corporate IT structure. Um, and the effect of that is that it took us uh, nine months to get into having a really effective online provision, which we've now had from January onwards. So the first two lockdowns, online provision was very, very sketchy and very reliant on things like Oak National Academy, BBC Bite Size, and other online, you know, online textbooks and those kinds of things that we procured at that point. So um, there's certainly uh, uh, things to things to learn from this period that we're going to want to persist with yeah. but also we've learned a bit about organizational resilience through uh, particularly from my perspective having worked at one super centralized trust and one completely uncentralized trust i've seen that the one where there was really strong uh, corporate um structures has given that organization a great deal more resilience th than my new one yeah, I, I think you found. I think um, so. Like I think School Zone, they did a, a survey across most teachers at the very beginning. You know, the first lockdown, uh, or towards the end of the first lockdown, a majority at that point were still. I think it was, it was as high as like eighty four percent were still sort of sending home coursework, you know, or, or homework via email. You know, and that just shows you how you know most of the country, most schools weren't prepared for the lock uh, for this um, particular lockdown, and, and obviously no one could foresee. Covid, so it's all very understandable, but it does also highlight, I suppose, like you just said, that you know having a strong IT infrastructure with a strong sort of a blended learning approach already will obviously you know support that any any future sort of lockdowns that might occur for other other reasons <laughs> potentially. Well, it's, it's been quite interesting actually. So there are a couple of things that emerge from this. One is that the independent school sector was immediately much more resilient than the state sector, 
And that's partly to do with having money to put into resources or perhaps already being better resourced, but also partly where the market forces were at play, you know, parents thinking, well, I'm paying for this, so I, I want something for my money. Schools incredibly rapidly transitioned to a full online timetable and just worked it out a long way ahead of the majority of schools in the in the state sector. So, you know, I do think that that's a uh, very interesting kind of thing that we've learned. Um, and the other thing that I would say is some things which have been always part of what state schools do, and I'm thinking particularly about snow days. Um, what we recently experienced was the demise of the snow day because as soon as we had snow recently in South Yorkshire, instead of the message going home, you know, schools closed today, it's a snow day. It was, we're immediately going to online learning. Your lessons will be on from nine o'clock this morning kind of thing. So there are going to be things like that, I think, where there'll be no more reason why not actually, why, why we can't simply flip when we need to, to learning from home. So that's interesting. So, so could you see... It's maybe where children in the in the future, I'm not saying right now, but in the future where where children may learn better at home because maybe less distraction and so on. Could you easily see the, the element of, you know, or going towards that individual learning style and saying, well, actually, do you not know, we are going to put on, you know, more lessons at home for you? Or do you think that's just too, uh, it's too an bigger overhead for teachers to actually enable them to basically do both? So I was in a, um, so the schools that are doing this best are um, engaging with children at home whilst also teaching in school. So I was in a school yesterday uh, where I was observing a maths lesson and there was um, an iPad on the front desk yeah. and I could see the three children who were all shielding, who were all learning at home, who could also see the teacher and they could see the whiteboard. So I had three children on the iPad and then 27 children in the class. And it was a, a sort of a seamless, literally blended some children at home some children in school with the teacher teaching that class so um those kinds of things i certainly think you know if you think ahead to um hospital schools for example and how children learn when they're away from school for a long period of time mm. uh, that that's something that may we may see an impact on uh, we've got quite a lot of children in my trust who've got stuck in their home country because they went home for Christmas and then couldn't get back. So children in Pakistan, Romania, Iran, Iraq, Somalia, who were all logging into lessons um, from other countries until they can get back to the UK. So yeah. we're seeing quite a lot of that as well. Um, so I do think that that blended kind of approach, um, there are some real positives to. The, um, we've also seen some um, children, particularly neurodiverse children who have a who really benefit from a quiet low distraction learning environment who have made real accelerated progress during this period of time through the use of technology and one of the things that we're wrestling with at the moment is how to maintain that so do we have them in the same classroom but with the earphones on watching a screen do we have them next door and um, with some kind of supervision but also able to access the same lesson and how do we make sure that we don't drive at um, accidentally excluding children or forcing children towards an elective home education, which obviously we don't want to do. Um, but, um, you know, we've got to be careful of that on the one hand, whilst recognising that some types of neurodiversity have really benefited from this period of time and have made quite significant accelerated progress. So, you know, there's a lot there's a lot to wrestle with there, actually a lot to think about. That's amazing. I think that's brilliant. Uh, I, it, which shows that in some cases, you know, when we're in a, you know, in a in, in a di difficult positions, uh, I think we were talking about it before we started recording. But uh, actually, sometimes things progress a lot better, you know, and 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 and, and we learn a lot. Actually, in, in some ways, I suppose you you get to the point you potentially can get to the point where there's no such thing as exclusions because ultimately they're constantly learning at home, even if they aren't in in school. So again, like you say, you, you, you I, get away. I absolutely agree. And, um, and certainly we're able to see, you know, if a child gets removed from a lesson, they can carry on with that lesson, albeit maybe in a quiet room somewhere else. Um, or if there's, you know, detentions, we can have proper online um, work being set for children. So they're not sort of sitting, staring into space. Um, and I think that we will see a reduction in exclusions what we can't do, though, is ask a child not to come in and go and study from home because that's just sort of um, preventing a child from having access to education, which obviously we're not allowed to do and nor would we want to. So 
it's important to make sure that we continue to follow appropriate processes for the management of behavior and sanctioning of children. But I do think in some circumstances, it opens up possibilities for children to continue to learn where their circumstances might otherwise prevent them from doing. For, for example, if they break their leg and are unable to get into school, but they're not you know, sick in the sense that they're unable to learn, then there may be a way of ensuring that a child can continue to learn even though they're not in the school building. Yeah, absolutely.